Yeah. Alright, let's do this. Hit the clap. Yeah. You fell for it. <laughs> Ready? Another one? No, that's it. We lied. So where 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 do we start? In the village. Starting back in the village where I grew up. So I was born in South Sudan, uh, in a town called Wat, born there, and then moved to a refugee camp, which is called uh, Kakuma Refugee Camp in, um, in Kenya. So I was about five, six years old when I first got to the camp. Um, so we stayed there for about two years. We moved there because there, there was a war and there was a lot of conflict that was happening in South Sudan. Um, that was like the priority for my parents to just try to get us to safety. And, um, and there was also a lot of South Sudanese that were already in that Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. Growing up there, you know, you see some familiar faces from where you're from back in South Sudan. There wasn't that much, you know, there wasn't that much. So you don't really grow up with, um, with shoes. Um, you'd have to go fetch some water from the water wells, you know. We shared a lot of things with your brothers. Um, siblings, I mean, brothers, cousins, third cousins, like everything is shared over there. Everything is, um, nothing is really yours, you know? So if you have, one person has a pair of shoes, everybody has a pair of shoes. If one person has a hoodie, everybody has a hoodie. So when you think about it now and like visualize what we had then was, yeah, was nothing at all, you know? But at the same time, the camp was kind of a lifesaver for a lot of people, you know? Cause it kind of gave everybody a second hope and a second chance. The biggest thing I remember the most was, um, not remember, like what I was doing a lot was playing soccer. That played a big part of my life as well, just like having that escape, you know, from just reality, just going to play soccer with my friends. So we'd get like a balloon, we would wrap it up in like t-shirts and just random materials. Um, and we just played soccer all night, all day. Um, that just kind of took us out of reality, you know, it took us out of like what was really going on. We were living in a different country, we were away from everything, you know? So obviously my parents and the experiences and the things that they know and the things that, you know, that they've been through is totally, totally different from the experiences that I, that I remember from the camp, you know? Obviously they talk about how um, the food was very limited. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of violence too that be happening in the camp too. Um, but I had no idea about that at that age. I didn't really understand it. So I know that my parents definitely been through a lot, a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, just, just, just like leaving your family and your life behind in South Sudan to move to a, to a refugee camp. You know, that's when you think about that now, it's like it's, that's a big challenge. I can't, I don't even know how to really describe it because, um, and I know a lot of people that that did that, that sacrificed their lives for their kids. You know. And then from that camp is the only way you can actually get a chance to um, get you know, like get your asylum to like either Australia, uh, America, or uh, other countries that accept like refugees, you know. So, um, so that camp definitely gave out a lot of opportunities for a lot of people, especially um, Australia accepted a lot of people from that camp, a lot of South Sudanese. Um, so fortunately, our family was accepted um, from the camp. When we first found out that we're gonna like our papers got approved to move to Australia, um, I didn't know what Australia was. Uh, I never really, I don't even know what an Australian looked like, you know. So hearing that, there was no any kind of excitement at all. I didn't really, I didn't really like, you know, feel any different. You know, I kind of felt sad in a way, you know. So I'm gonna be leaving my friends. I'm gonna be leaving the life that I know, you know. Because from the camp, we had to go to uh, to Nairobi to get ready for that process to go to go to um, to Australia. Yeah, that's different. That's a different story now. <laughs> that's my first time. Um, so when we got to Nairobi, that was really my first time seeing uh, like seeing him in the toilet. I don't know why I keep like remembering a toilet. Seeing a toilet was like something that I vividly remember. Um, that was like a big shock to me. And uh, a TV, I saw a TV there. Um, so seeing that for the first time was just an experience. So when we were at the airport, you know, we're seeing all kind of different people, you know, and um, this was kind of like really my first time seeing a white person, you know. You see pictures, you see, you hear about things, boom, boom, but I never really experienced that. So when I saw those, you know, people from different ethnicities that looked different from me, it was kind of like a scary thing in a way. I never really understood that 
there were so many different people out there in the world that looked different compared to me, you know? Obviously, you know, at that age, you don't really have a choice to, you know, to to go where you want to go. But just like, you just pretty much just follow your parents and trust that they know what they're doing. When I first got to Australia, it was real difficult. Um, I didn't really, obviously the biggest challenge was like the language barrier, because I just couldn't communicate with anybody, you know? I'd go to school. Um, when I started school, like my first day, I was trying to talk like my language to to the students, you know, to the teachers, and I couldn't I couldn't explain myself in anything. So that was really really challenging just to get thrown out there to try to just figure it out. I kind of just wanted to just go back to a, to an environment that I knew and where I felt comfortable in. But you know, once I opened my mind up a little bit and kind of felt that you know this is not as bad. There was a program in my school called like, you know, ESL, English Second Language um, program. And then, so I was in that program for a while, just trying to learn how to read and write because I didn't go to school where I was coming from. Um, so throughout primary school, um, I was playing pretty much soccer, you know? And then um, once I got to high school, I started to see a little bit of like, you know, AFL, which is like Australian football, um, a little bit of rugby, a little bit of, um, what else did I play? Badminton, like just a bunch of sports in, um, in, high, in high school. And then um, basketball was always, I always see kids playing it, but there was never something that I was like ever interested in because I, I had more fun playing soccer and, um, and Australian football. But then slowly my body started growing. I think it was like year nine, I saw like a flyer that was in our, that was in our, our school gym inside. And it was a lady called um, Helen Fisher. It was her team. She was like the president of that team. She's also a coach. So I gave her a call, and she told and she told me that um, yeah, right now, uh, well, our team is full. After maybe a week or two, she gave me a call. She was saying that okay, there's a spot open. Um, and this and like in this the area that they played in was about um, 25 minutes, 30 minutes away from where I was living. And I was, so usually at that age, I was catching buses. And there was no bus that would get there in time for the game. So you would have to catch like multiple buses. And now on the weekends, like the schedule for the buses is a little bit, it's a little bit different. There's less buses, you know? And then um and then I told her about it and she said, she said, um, I'll, I'll come and pick you up, you know? And then it started off with me. Then my brother wanted to come play basketball too. And then my other brother wanted to come play basketball. Then she started to come pick all three of us up every morning to go play. Um, it started off like that, and um, without her, I don't think that for sure, for sure, I would not, I would not be playing basketball today. So throughout high school, um, and like the tenth grade, when I started taking basketball a little bit more serious, um, I found a community, a South Sudanese community that that um, they had a team, you know, they had a team called Rhinos, uh, the Perth Rhinos, and um, so they would go and compete. Um, in the eastern, in the eastern states, twice a year in June, no, sorry, in July and December. So from there, you know, that's where I, I got a chance to meet a lot of, you know, South Sudanese guys that played basketball. I mean, I didn't really get a chance to travel out of state besides for that tournament, you know. But like that tournament, like kind of like, gave me like a, a, what's the word, like a like a different perspective, you know, like kind of just opened my mind up of like what basketball can do for me, you know, just playing at that big tournament. A lot of like professionals came from there, you know. That's where my um, my scholarship for a junior college came up that saw me at that tournament. I got an offer from uh, from Lee College, um, Marcus King, which who is uh, an assistant, assistant coach for that junior college, came down and he saw me playing at that tournament. Um, he had a conversation with me after one of my games and just told me like, you know, you can you could be a really good basketball player and you can have a chance to ch change your life, you know, change your family's life. Um, so that that really like, you know, impacted me because I really thought about like, I didn't think that, I didn't really think that a basketball, basketball would change my life, you know, because coming from where I come from and like the culture that, that we have and like the mentality that our parents tell us is like, go to school, Get get a degree and like get a job and um like you know and you're gonna be you're gonna be okay you know you they will never tell you to play basketball um to 
you know, just go chase chase that dream of yours and you change your life playing basketball, you know. That's something you never that you will never hear, you know, from like from parents that come from like a you know, like a refugee background, you know, immigrants, for example. They, they wouldn't they wouldn't think like that. But then maybe like a month after that he sent me an email, he's like, you know, like I'm serious about this. Um, you know, we would love you to come here on a scholarship. You're gonna be able to finish you be able to go to school as well for free. And um so that's probably the one of the biggest motivators to come over to come over here to America um, was, you know, to be able to go to school. Leaving Australia to go to America was another challenge. First of all, just telling my my mom especially, she didn't really want me to leave at all. She didn't really want me to go, but like I felt like that was something that I had to do um, to give us a chance. But that was just a challenge, you know, just leaving my family behind, leaving my siblings behind. I just didn't feel, I felt like I had, I had to, um, just had to focus when I, when I got to America. I had to make sure that I can't let them down, you know? I wanted to make sure that I go back and see them with something, you know? Um, so that was a big motivator as well. And also just from always like in the back of my mind, I always know that um, come from where I come from, all the way back to the refugee camp, I always remember that like any kid that would be given like an opportunity like this to be able to go to school for free, to be able to play basketball, to be able to um, just have this opportunity in front of them, um, they would take advantage of it. I had no idea what a junior college was. I thought I was going to be there for about four years. Um, and then over the <laughs> over time, I started to understand, okay, this is a, this is just a short stint, you know? You got to just come here and you have to play actually really well to have a chance to get a, to go to a next level. So there was, I didn't know there was a next level you had to go to. Um, so the next level was to get another scholarship. And then, um, and then over time in my junior college, I felt like I started getting better in basketball because we worked really, really hard and Marcus was really on me. He understood, um, he understood me as like my value system and why I was there and why I wanted to, what, what I wanted to do for my family, you know? So he always, he was on me. I think he was on me a little bit, a little bit more than other people, you know? So he always tell me like, like, man, if you don't, you know, if you're not working, if you don't want to work as hard, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna send you home. Or you say some stuff like that, just to try to get me to work even even harder, you know? Because I'm gonna send you home. Like you're gonna you're gonna lose your scholarship if you don't if you don't do this, you don't do that. Obviously, um basketball was something that that was there, but like it's always school. School was always like on my mind, because nobody in my family, immediate family, ever graduated. Um so to be able to walk that stage. Um, I had a very like emotional conversation with my mom. She just couldn't believe it, you know? Um, she was just really proud of me. Uh, she just kept emphasizing like, you know, you did it, you really did a good job. Um, you know, obviously it was just a, a junior college, but I think that just making that step in life uh, opened a lot of doors for, just for my family in general. So I got a bunch of Division One scholarships, um, but then I kind of cut it down to just a couple of schools that I was kind of interested in. And then, uh, so I got that LSU offer, which was um, which was just down the road from my junior college. It was something that I never seen before. It was yeah, it was crazy. Um, just seeing a facility like that, I couldn't believe it was a school. David Patrick played a part too with my LSU recruiting. Um, he was uh, one of the assistants that was over there. Um, obviously, he's Australian. So um, when he came down to my junior college, we just had a conversation. Um, he told me that he was going to be there, and um, you know, just having having a familiar face over there kind of helped me with my decision a lot too um, to to choose LSU. You know, my basketball wasn't, you know. It was a priority, but like I felt like school was first, and um, and LSU was a big school, so I felt okay. Surely, um, this would be one of my. If I get a degree from here, it would be, it would be really, you know, helpful for my future once I, once I'm done playing basketball. Then that's when I kind of, kind of understood that okay, if I get to this level, um, and play, and and do well and play and play at this level, I felt like okay. I might have a chance, you know, I might have a chance to be able to play professionally somewhere after this.
But firstly, when I was younger, I wanted to just, I didn't think I would be like a professional basketball player or anything like that. I kind of just wanted to um, just be a mechanic, you know? I I enjoyed fixing bikes around the neighborhood and um, and a mechanic was some like being a, like a mechanic and having my own shop was something that, you know, that's, how, that's, that's what I wanted to do growing up. Um, and then basketball just kind of just came out of, you know, nowhere in a way. Um, but then I just kind of went into that mentality into like my college, along to, my, to LSU as in like, to try to get better, you know? I know it sounds like, you know, everybody's trying to get better, but like, I kind of just, cause I, I started playing late, you know? So I kind of was always a step behind and everybody was so far ahead of me. And I just felt like everybody was just so good, you know, like a basketball, but I always felt like I just kind of raced, I took my own race, you know, just kind of worked on things that, okay, I need to get better in this. I need to do this, I need to do that. And yeah, it just paid off slowly and slowly and slowly. So uh, when I graduated LSU, um, you know, those opportunities in the G League, um, there were some opportunities. I did I did a couple of like NBA pre-draft workouts, which was a good experience just to kind of like see the level that I was at and what I needed to do to to get to that level. Um, so that was a that was a great experience to do those pre pre workouts. But like at the same time, I still needed to get better, you know. Um, and Europe was the best route for me at that time. So we went to Serbia uh, for for my first year. I was playing for a team called uh, FMP, which is kind of like a it's a it's a it's a good league, you know. It's in the ABA league, but um, it's a team that's known just for developing young guys, you know. But then about going to Europe, I had no idea again um, about the about the leagues out there, about how things operate. Because in America and the college systems, they don't really talk too much about Europe. You know, it's always just about NBA, NBA, NBA. They don't really teach you about, okay, these are the divisions in Europe. These are the leagues in Europe. These, you know, this is what you do. You could start at the third division and move up into the first division. You don't really get taught that in college. So going there was kind of like another, another like, you know, time to develop, time to adapt, time to learn, time to, like, it's just another, sounds like another story, you know? So I got there my first year in Serbia, really, really tough, you know? Coming from LSU, um, you know, that's one of the best facilities out there. Everything is, everything is great, high level. Um, then going to a team like FNP, the facilities are not like the ones we had at LSU. Um, but like the first month was really, was really challenging, um, different languages. Yeah, so I did one year there, and then um, I came back, I did another year, FNP again. Um, and then my third year, I was with Red Star, which is a EuroLeague team. They're, um, they're kind of connected to FNP, so if you do well at FNP, they kind of send you to that um, to Red Star. You know, they usually send you to Red Star. We had a game in Turkey against uh, FS, and I get a phone call from uh, Brian Gorgian, who is the head coach of the national team. Um, he was just telling me, we're going to have you on the, on the training camp for the Olympic squad. Like, I didn't, I had no idea, like, I didn't know I was even in the radar to be, you know, to be put on a score like that. And just seeing the names that were on the list, you know, guys like Matisse Taibu, you know, these are like superstars, you know. So seeing those guys, I couldn't, um, I couldn't believe that I, my name was even like, with them, because um, I just felt like I was just in a whole different, you know, category. Just over there in Europe, just doing my, just doing my thing, trying to just, trying to just develop, trying to get better at basketball. And it kind of felt like um, that the hard work that that I've been putting in through those, you know, those years, um, was kind of like paying off. You know, kind of like a encouragement to just keep going. It made me feel like just keep going. You know, like being recognized for the hard work that you're putting in. And then when I made the final roster, then that was, you know, that was a, that was like an unbelievable, like an unbelievable moment for me. And then, I, you know, my mom started crying. She couldn't believe it. She was just happy for me, you know? She just, because she understands and she know, like the, just everything that I've been through, she understands it. What was your role in the Olympic team? Yeah, my role was in, um, my role with the team was just, I felt like, I felt like my role was important too, in a way. You know, obviously my role wasn't to be the guy that, like a Patty Mill role or anything like that. But I felt like 
everybody had to play their role, you know, in that team. That's why we meddled. And, um, like, even just making that team, I was the first, um, you know, African to be able to to be able to play in in a, an Olympic team, you know, for in basketball for Australia. To be able to just see yourself uh, compared to the to the like NBA players to to um, to measure where you're at, um, you know, it's always an eye opener. I think like the NBA for me has always been like a it's a dream, you know, but it always feels like something that's very, very far away. It's almost, I wouldn't say impossible, it's definitely possible, but like it's almost like, especially from the journey that I took and the route that um that I took, it was definitely gonna be like real challenging, you know, just to be able to have that opportunity. But then so my mentality was just every year um, to just go tr give it a try, you know? So my first year I did summer league um, with uh, with Brooklyn, um, we had Jared Allen on the team, and you know he's he's a like a solidified player in the NBA. So just to practice against him to see where I was at, I knew that okay, there's some things that I got to work on. There's some things I got to get better on. And you know I'm very like honest with myself. You know I don't really like I'm not gonna lie to myself and be like oh. You know, you're supposed to be this, this, this. No, I'm very, I feel like I'm very always honest with myself. So I felt like, okay, there's some things I got to work on to get better on. And, and then I um, went back to Europe. And then from then, I went to the NBL. I went back to Australia. Um, I just kind of felt like during that time in my career, um, it was just the right time to go back home. Um, I kind of just miss, you know, being around just family and friends and familiar faces. Um, and I also felt like it was really good for my development again. Um, to be able to play in the NBL, and, you know, and playing for Brian Gojan over there was like a, you know, it was really big for my career as well. I came back, I did some look with Phoenix. I was feeling, that summer I was feeling um, very, very confident, you know, and I felt that, okay, I got a chance, you know. So I had my first game in the summer league, and it was a, I had a solid game, you know. I um, came, off, came off the bench, played with some energy, um, I had a really solid game. And then uh, my second game, um, I rolled my ankle in the first in the first few minutes of the game, and I was that was you know was shut down. So I felt like um, this is still a great opportunity to see where I was at, you know. And I felt like I'm getting a little bit closer now. I feel like I'm getting better at basketball. I feel like I'm starting to understand what I'm good at, and what I'm not good at, you know. And um, so then I went to China that year. After China, I went straight to Lebanon. I played there for two months. I had a great time in Lebanon. Um, kind of was like a reju like a kind of felt rejuvenated, you know, about basketball. I won a championship out there. And then my agent told me that okay, we have a like Poland's interested to bring you in for summer league, you know. And this would have been my this would be my fourth summer league. Um, so I've been a so I've experienced every every roller coaster in the summer league because summer league is kind of just a it's a challenge, you know, for guys that like borderline guys, you know, it usually favors the draft picks and um, roster guys and a couple of guys they're really trying to have a look at, but like it doesn't really favor guys like me, you know, that come from, you know, China or Le they're playing in Lebanon, they're playing in Lebanon. So um, when that opportunity came up, I kind of was just like, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, we can, um, we can go give it another try. It'll probably be my, you know, because I'm getting a little older, but I say it's probably my last summer league because I don't think a guy is going to, if I had to wait another year, I don't think any team is going to try to get bring a 27-year-old, um, a 28-year-old to a summer league team. So I felt like, okay, this is my last opportunity really for the NBA. So luckily, like, Poland, you know, called and they said, we're going to bring you in for, like, training camp. Um, and that would, like, that felt like, like I had my foot in the door when I got that moment, you know? I felt like, damn, like, you got a you got a chance to play in the NBA now. Like you got a chance to be around NBA players on a day to day basis. You know, during the training camp, I felt pretty pretty positive. I felt like I was holding you know I was holding my own. I was doing pretty okay. Um, I felt like I was competing, and I felt like I had a chance. You know, and then they made like the final cuts and stuff like that. Um, so um, the GM called me into the office. During that meeting, I felt like whatever he says, 
um, I felt like I did my best to my ability. Like, there's nothing else I could have did. If I make it, okay, cool. If I don't, I can live with my life knowing, like, you had your opportunity because that's all you can really ask for, you know? Like, when I pray to God, I just tell him that, just give me my chance, you know? Give me my opportunity, and that's it. That's all I want. So the GM, uh, Joe, we had a conversation in his office, and he kind of told me, like, okay, we're going to have to waive you. And then uh, when I first heard that, you know, that wave, I was just like, um, it was like a, you know, you, you you feel like your heart just, you know, like, damn. And then he told me that, okay, we're going to convert you to a two-way contract. And then from then, I just felt like, oh, damn, like, you kind of made it, you know? You kind of made it, but at the same time, when you get when you hear that you got waived and you feel like you made it, it it's mixed emotions. There's a lot of mixed emotions to it, you know? I did feel like I made it. I definitely feel like I made it. But then it didn't really hit until um until I probably play, played um that first game when I walked into that when I walked into um the crypto arena. You know you're in the crypto arena once you um do that little walk from the bus to um to the locker room. You see like the um the little I don't know how to describe it though, it's just it's like a little writing on the wall like Portland versus uh Lakers or Clippers. You see it on the wall and um once you see that, okay, you know this is the real this is the real deal because you are seeing it on T V, you seen it on social media, that little that little hallway right there. And then, um, then you get in the locker room and you don't really think like it's like reality, you know, until you actually get there. You think like something that you just see on TV and just something that you, that for me to be there in that environment at that time, it was just like, even I was, I was telling Matisse the first time I walked out there, like onto the court, like the lights a little bit, the lights feel a little bit brighter. The court feels, the court like just, it's a diff. It's the feel. It's like a feeling where you feel like it doesn't feel real. You know, it feels like you're living in a dream. Also, it feels like something's meant to be in your life. I felt like it's it's, it's, it's a high chance it's going to be. You know, and I felt like that moment was like something that just I don't know something that was just meant to be. You know, and it felt like okay, you know, you you in your dream right now. Like enjoy it. You know, have fun. And just show like real gratitude and gratification for like being there, like, cause not a lot of people are gonna ever experience play on that court, you know, and to be able to, to be there, it's just like a man, it's just a blessing.